Uh, this is the second part uh, of two parts in kind of a overview in Comb CT for your dental office. Um, I talked about that title last week. And, uh, you know, the title is really launching Comb CT technology in your dental office, which really kind of implies that you're just getting started. Uh, I designed these talks to be um, for any dental office, any dental specialty, whether you are just getting started in Comb CT, already using and feeling expert, or even if you're the office that uh, won't ever buy and run your own, you'll find hopefully relevant information. It's stuff that I think um, you will find necessary in uh, kind of today's dental practice, in my opinion. So I'll mention too, another reason I'm gonna hide my video stream tonight is my wife, who is a high school biology teacher, is currently proctoring uh, makeup examinations via her uh, web meeting platform through her school. And we only have so much bandwidth upload capacity in this household. So I'm gonna uh, hopefully take a little less in hopes of preserving more on your end. Okay, here's objectives from last week. And I just want to revisit those as a reminder of where we, where we were and what we discussed. Um, we visited really the strengths and weaknesses of different ways of viewing cone beam CT data. That's the slices the 3D renderings, and then the reconstructed radiographs. And the bottom line there is, if you need to see the detail, you must be looking at uh, those slices. Um, we also talked about really approaching any scan with confidence. Um, you know, if you have one, you're just getting started, or a patient walks in with that scan in their hand, plug it into your computer and go. You're not gonna hurt anything. Um, look for your reference lines, look for the right and left markers and start to scroll and look for that way to reconstruct the pan um, to work your way through the teeth. Uh, we talked quite a bit about this interplay of image quality radiation dose and chosen scan factors. We're gonna build on that tonight uh, in a very practical sense. Um, and we also talked about the relevant risks of x-rays and dental imaging. So here's our objectives for tonight. Um, I want to build on this discussion of when to order a Combium CT scan. And from there, we will uh, segue into what, what buttons do you really push on the machine? This is not a put the patient in and push and hold the same button every type of scenario. Um, and I want to build out really what you're thinking diagnostically and then what we should get in terms of resolution, scan time, field of view, et cetera, for those patients. Um, from there, I wanna switch gears and really touch on the basic strategies and responsibilities of image interpretation. We're gonna be talking really about kind of interpretation philosophy and theory and some legal requirements, uh, just touching the basics of that. Um, and then we'll wrap up the evening with a review of really the best imaging practices for implant treatment planning and how you can think about that. Um, this, again, is a really an overview course. If you want more in-depth discussion of any of these topics, you can look at some of uh, our other University of Minnesota CE radiology offerings. We've got a wonderful hands-on course. Uh, it's about a day and a half. We spend a little bit of time doing lecture, but the, most, um, uh, most of the rest of the course is spent hands-on at a computer working through cases. Um, and we do that a couple times a year. So you've seen this slide last week. And the question is when to acquire an image. We're discussing cone beam C tonight, um, but really this applies to any dental imaging uh, regardless if it, if it uses ionizing imaging, or sorry, ionizing radiation. And what we discussed last week is the question you really need to ask yourself is, does it change your treatment plan in any way? Many times it'll, change your diagnosis as well. But this is the question you need to be asking yourself. Even if it, uh, acquiring that 3D information or acquiring that radiograph uh, influences a treatment plan, even in the slightest manner, it's worth getting. Um, ultimately, we should be thinking about patient outcome in society, but on an individual practice base, those are hard to answer. You need studies to do those. Um, your practitioner confidence and patient education alone are not good reasons uh, to standalone order uh, an, 
at Holmium CT. So we also talked about these points here and if there is a diagnostic need for that 3D information, go ahead and order that scan, get it. Um, and I use diagnostic here generally. So back to my prior scan, it may change your diagnosis, but if it helps you diagnostically influence or alter your treatment plan, it's worthwhile getting. Uh, but you do have to prescribe radiographic exams with care. Uh, and part of that care is adjusting our scan field of view resolution and scan times to meet diagnostic needs. And we drove into each one of these factors quite in depth last week um, to really uh, understand what the machine is doing and what it means for image quality and dose for our patients. And the bottom line is that your desired scan or image quality has to be dictated by the diagnostic goal not the desire for a nice looking image every time. In other words, we get the image quality we need to figure out what we need to know, nothing more, nothing less. And we always remember that our pediatric patients need a little extra care. They're anywhere from three to 10 times more radio sensitive. So at this point, um, I, I'll, I'll share that in general, I really like to structure my slides and presentations so you really don't have to take notes. And, and uh, on that note, I will suggest that in upcoming few minutes, uh, you may want to take a piece of paper out and scribble down a few details simply because I've got some technical information I wanna share. Um, I know Joe and I are working together to uh, have some of this content out and available to you, but that'll take a few weeks. So if this, if this, these nerdy numbers coming up are really fascinating and interesting to you, write them down now. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about is uh, some different indications, so kind of patient reasons to acquire a Combium CT and what resolutions and scan times you should be looking at. So we'll start with implant planning. And the first thing we'll talk about is most implant plan Combium CTs are medium field of view scans of either the single arch or both arches together, depending on the prosthetic need of that opposing arch information, um, obviously the planned implant sites, and then also any potential graft sites and information. And we commonly separate the teeth out for a couple reasons. Uh, one, to reduce artifact. That's also the same reason we may elect to scan a single arch only by cutting that other arch out of the scan. We can reduce some artifact and create a little cleaner image, uh, less noisy image. But we can additionally maintain some of that occlusal information, which can be useful uh, for planning and visualizing where you're going to want your prosthetic crown, but also then interfacing some of that information with uh, other occlusal information if you're doing a guided surgery. And we'll come back and discuss that in a moment. Uh, do remove any metal appliances that you can to minimize artifact. Um, and of course, always stabilize the patient to reduce motion. So here are some example fields of view uh, for implant planning. This is an eight by eight centimeter scan of both arches. Many times for most patients with eight by eight, you can get back to the second molars. This is a little bit younger, smaller patient. So we're going back a little bit farther. It's a very useful two arch field of view and notice the teeth are separated so we get nice clean occlusal contours. Uh, in a different unit, these scans here come from an ICAT unit in our university clinics. Uh, we commonly will scan based on the planned implant site, the mandibular arch or the maxillary arch only. And the reason for that, as I stated earlier, is once we cut that other arch out of the scan field of view, some artifact and noise drops out and get a little clearer image. Uh, we also maintain those occlusal contours. So I'm building on this comb beam CT protocol for implant planning here and point out that most voxel sizes are anywhere from 0.2 to 0.3. Occasionally you'll see a 0.15. We don't go much higher or lower than this. It's a nice working resolution for implant planning. And we'll elect to take short to medium scan times if we're simply wanting a general visualization of that patient's anatomy. Um, what we're going to get is a medium to high noise level. You can see your critical anatomy, the canals, the alveolar height and width, sinus, uh, etc. 
if we are going to do a guided surgery, the requirements change a little bit. You want a nice, crisp image to end up fusing that uh, guided surgery with, for example, a scanned impression or intraoral scan and build a uh, guide to foreign or tissue bone, for example, to that data. So the noise requirements, the image quality requirements get quite a bit higher. And so we will commonly elect for a medium to long scan time uh, where we use a little bit higher dose for the uh, patient, um, but we get a lower medium to noise. And how we get that is you either turn on an HD mode or you select that 30 second scan instead of the 15 or 10 second scan. It depends machine by machine. Um, and if you just experiment, you can figure that out. Uh, much of the time uh, I, I see practitioners um, imaging the entire arch uh, that kind of gives us a nice comprehensive arch evaluation. Um, also identifies graft sites. Um, and with that entire arch, you can many times get the best um, guide fit. Uh, and that would be opposed to a smaller five by five field of view where you're limiting, really zooming in on a single implant site. The last point I have here, and we'll come back and revisit this point, is if you are doing guided surgery, that scan leaves this realm of diagnostic visual information only for your brain and becomes essentially a virtual final impression, or if you will, a virtual articulator. Um, and so they're diagnostically two very different things. And so you have to really treat all that data then as a final impression, as a virtual articulator setup um, with all the attention to detail uh, step by step. We'll come back and revisit that discussion later on this evening. Very good. So let's talk about useful CMBCT techniques for endodontics. We touched on this briefly last week, uh, but we're commonly going to select the smallest field of view to the teeth or tooth of interest. And that will allow us to get the voxel size as small as possible. So we're going to have as high a resolution as we can. Uh, we're going to select the longest scan time we can out of that machine or turn on that HD mode. Um, and that's going to you know, use the highest dose um, the machine will uh, put out. But what we're going to get from that are the lowest noise levels, which are going to allow us the best chance at visualizing the really small anatomic details, the canals, the fractures, et cetera. Uh, resolutions here, I'll go back to this, are you know, down less than a tenth of a millimeter uh, at, at um, many of the popular endodontic cone beam CT units or units that are common in cone beams or endodontic offices. Uh, if you have a patient that uh, it has trouble staying still for that, for example, long 30 second scan, you might elect for the medium scan time. Uh, if they can stay still for 15 seconds, but not 30 seconds, you're gonna come out ahead uh, by avoiding motion artifact with that 15 second scan, despite the, a slight noise and image quality penalty. Um, and the endodontic residents always roll their eyes whenever I bring this up, but if you really need to see what's going on inside of a tooth, uh, fracture-wise or accessory canal-wise, and the tooth is previously treated, uh, you have to remove that arbitration material first. That's gonna get rid of quite a bit of artifact that is otherwise inevitable associated with that arbitration material um, and let you see a little better. Um, but I understand and I know that's a lot of work and not commonly done. Okay. Just a couple pictures of endodontic scans. Uh, here's one here where we've got, a, 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 excuse me, a, a pre-op uh, after uh, access attempt scan of this anterior incisor and then sometime later a post-op where we can verify healing. Uh, I'll just mention by the wayside here that with cone beam CT, what is unique to that in dentistry is it's the only imaging modality where uh, we can compare time point A and time point B very accurately. Um, and in fact, I can, with fancier software, superimpose these two scans and see exactly what's changing here, not only in lesion size, but what in the world is going on posterior to it with this large radiolucent mass. 
Um, and if you were able to attend one of our Home Beam CT hands-on courses, we talk a bit about volume superimposition uh, and that approach and pathology like this. Again, reinforcing this uh, use of the highest resolution possible, um, if you are suspicious of a, a fracture, be it vertical or horizontal or, or cracked tooth, go for the highest resolution you can. Many times with cracked tooth, because of restorations, um, we can't tell what's going on in the crown, but in a case like this, occasionally we'll just get a hint of the smallest possible visible horizontal root fracture. And there's, of course, a bony reaction here and here, which is giving it a clue. But I bring this up because fracture research is uh, one of my interests, and we know that there are tooth cracks and fractures in all orientations that are much smaller than the resolution limits of our available comb beam CT scan in um, at this time. Uh, so we basically have to give the best chance we can image it as high as resolution as possible um, to hopefully pick up on some of these very minute fractures. Let's look at comb beam CT technique for orthodontics. Uh, there's really two common approaches. The first one is a large field of view for generally assessing the bony and tooth spatial relationships of your patient. Um, and we're gonna pick a fairly low resolution, anywhere from 0.3 to 0.5 millimeters, a shorter scan time, five to 10 seconds. We're gonna get from that high noise, but a quite low dose. The detail needs for this setup are not like in endodontics. You just need to see where things roughly are um, in relation to other structures. Uh, the second approach in orthodontics is a more focused and detailed approach where you select a medium field of view um, uh, with higher detail. And that would be, say you have an impacted tooth or suspected root resorption or another unique uh, abnormality or possible pathology. We go down to a higher resolution, 0.1 to 0.3 millimeters with a medium to long scan time. Uh, we get a higher resolution uh, and lower noise, but at the expense of a higher dose. Uh, and of course, this is for this focused approach. You're trying to address a very specific um, um, clinical or dental condition or situation at, with detail. So here's our large field of view. Uh, for general diagnosis and treatment planning. This is a young patient, cleft lip and palate, and hemifacial, or sorry, hemimandibular hypoplasia with an associated occlusal cant. And the 3D information here uh, is uh, more or less necessary um, to address the cant and where everything is. The more focused approach would be a medium field of view, like in this case, where we've got impacted canines coming close to these first premolars, uh, and we need to evaluate, are they resorbing the roots and how bad of these premolars? We can also get a very nice uh, planned look at the orientations of these teeth with respect to each other. If we look at useful comb beam CT technique for pathology, uh, we generally recommend a, a voxel size about on par with implant planning, 0.2 to 0.3 millimeters. Um, and our recommendation is unless the pathology is very clearly localized, they have a very small jaw lesion, uh, we tend to order a larger field of view than we think we need with the goal of imaging the entire lesion. Nothing is worse than having some unknown lesion, imaging it and realizing we didn't capture it all and we don't uh, uh, have to go back and image them again. Um, scanning bilaterally is part of that thought process. Uh, what scanning bilaterally does is allow us to compare right versus left. Uh, many times some uh, suspected pathology uh, is really a variation of normal anatomy. And if the patient is asymptomatic and nothing is wrong clinically, and we can see the same change bilaterally, uh, we're more comfortable calling it a variation of normal anatomy. We're typically selecting a medium to long scan time um, to get a higher dose, but best visualization of those pathologic and anatomic details. You're driving noise levels down. We really don't know what we're getting to, so we're erring on the side of more information is better. In this case, we know something is wrong, 
so we have clinical indication to investigate um, uh, more aggressively than, for example, the asymptomatic uh, implant patient or orthodontic patient. This is a nice example of some pathology here with a large expansile uh, lesion in the jaw. Uh, this was a cystic ameloblastoma. I like this case um, uh, with respect to our prior um, talk last week because I had a surgeon actually come to me after reviewing this case and say, hey, I saw this rendering and went in surgically and was expecting just to see this thin, you know, layer of bone left and get right at these teeth, but instead I ran into this layer of bone. What was going on? Um, what that surgeon didn't recognize is this rendering was misleading like we discussed last week. It basically took this outer shell of bone, eroded it away from the actual rendering, um, and then it, that, again, is, reinforces my point of what, if you need to see the detail where the bone is, you must be looking at the slicing. If we look at useful cone beam CT technique for TMD, uh, voxel sizes are typically anywhere from 0.25 to 0.3 millimeters. And uh, uh, we'll commonly order a large field of view that includes the TMD uh, J's, um, as a typo there, apologies for that, um, and both jaws. Uh, commonly, that's about a 13 by 17 centimeter scan. And we'll commonly scan the patient in a closed uh, occlusion, so maximum intercuspation, to get an idea of how those joints are potentially oriented in the fossa. Uh, there's some discussion and different opinions about uh, ordering a cone beam CT scan uh, with the patient in an open position to adjust, uh, assess uh, the condylar position. Uh, one thought is you can really document where that condyle is. Um, other thoughts is that that information, um, uh, you can really figure out clinically. Uh, in my, uh, not without getting into the weeds, it really depends on a specific clinical question if I recommend opening, uh, having the patient scanned in an open position or not. One of the most common indications uh, is if you're worried about um, uh, coronoid process enlargement and impingement on the zygomatic arch anteriorly, a very quick and easy diagnosis uh, is to have them open all the way, image them, and if we see that coronoid process running into the arch, we have our diagnosis. If uh, the, a large field of view is not available, uh, acquiring medium or small fields of view of bolt joints is acceptable um, and works very well. Uh, but we do recommend imaging bolt joints um, in a closed position. And the reasons for that is many times if a patient is symptomatic on one side, radiographic changes may be on the other side or vice versa. It gets complicated. Uh, so in general, we uh, image both joints regardless of symptoms. And we're picking a medium to long scan time or uh, some medium to high dose for visualization of those anatomic details of the joints. We really don't need the quote unquote endodontic level detail, um, but we're not getting by with just the 0.3 to 0.4 ortho level detail. Here's a nice example of some specific TMJ arch sections. Uh, uh, in our discussions last week, we talked about when and what clinical scenarios to order imaging of joints. Um, one of those is if you're suspicious of some other occult pathology occurring in the joint that, that is not consistent with more typical um, kind of temporomandibular disorder presentations. This is one of these cases where the TMD and orofacial pain specialist saw this young woman. Uh, the clinical presentation was atypical for kind of common temporomandibular disorder. And again, I'm glossing over a lot of details here, uh, but after the disease wasn't responding to normal kind of first line therapy, elected for imaging, and we found this very destroyed appearance to the condyle on this side. Um, and this turned out to be a metastatic uh, breast carcinoma that had planted itself in the condylar head. Now that's a very rare case and a frightening case. Um, and so they do not happen all the time, uh, but it can happen. And this is one example. All right, 
So you can put down the notepads at this point. Uh, if you're a chronic note taker, um, you're welcome to keep them up. But at this point, I'll say my slides are more geared back towards uh, um, kind of sitting back, listening, and I want you to uh, think about my principles uh, that I'm discussing as opposed to writing down all the words. So I'm gonna switch gears and discuss interpretation fundamentals as a really starting point with how to think about your responsibilities and approaches to uh, interpreting and reviewing any radiographic image, um, uh, whether it's a paratypical bite wing or a combium CT. So let's talk about radiographic interpretation. Uh, and my boring textbook definition is radiographic interpretation is the ability to recognize and understand what is revealed by a diagnostic image. Great. That is best done with a routine or I will say structured search. And what I mean by that is you have a set way that you review every single comb beam CT or pan or full mouth series uh, and you do it that same way every time. So before I get on to my uh, additional points, I'll, I'll explain to you my chrome beam CT approach. Um, and is that I open it up and I start with the NPR view and I will scroll top to bottom several times reviewing kind of categories of anatomy, airways, uh, bony contours, teeth, soft tissue, up and down. And so I'm going multiple classes up and down. And then uh, I'll go side to side with the same patient and have a similar kind of every pass I look like at a category of anatomy. And then I'll go front to back. So I triple check myself in those MPR views and I make a mental checklist of uh, uh, all the abnormalities I want to note in a report. Then once I'm done with that, I'm comfortable uh, with every, reviewing everything. I will go reconstruct the pan, just takes a few seconds and I will uh, count all the teeth, make sure there's nothing missing, nothing extra. Uh, and then go tooth by tooth and evaluate dental pathology uh, and note there. And then based on my uh, uh, findings and earlier views, I may do a specific PMJ scan uh, images to evaluate the joints. That's my structured search. I do every comb beam CT that way all the time. And the reason for that is I have the best chance at recognizing normal versus all the abnormal findings and not miss anything. The big fear with this, all this data is I don't want to miss anything. And, you, and the best chance of doing that is using a structured search. Uh, the opposite or where you can get into trouble is with a free or unstructured search. So what that looks like is if you just uh, jump into a scan and you're concerned about, for example, implant site number 19, and you go straight to that implant site. What you have not done is disciplined yourself and looked through the entire scan volume, and you may miss some very large surprise findings. That's an unstructured search. Uh, and it's actually an example of something called satisfaction of search, which is a really silly sounding term, uh, but if you read a radiology textbook, you'll find it. What that means is uh, a couple things. One, you are preoccupied mentally with for example, your implant site, and you go straight there and get the inf information you want regarding that implant site. Um, uh, you are satisfied, so to speak, in your imaging quest, and you forget to look elsewhere for other findings. The other way satisfaction of search can show up is if you open up a scan and you find a surprise or incidental finding that's really interesting, and you're completely engrossed and fascinated by this surprise, uh, finding it might be a cyst, it might be a tumor, could be anything. Um, you're satisfied then in that you found something interesting, but you forgot to complete that entire top to bottom, front to back, side to side search of the entire scan volume. Um, and you maybe missed the additional piece of pathology on the other side of the patient, for example. So a great radiology teacher of mine told me, you know, stick to your routine, stick to your structured search, and as soon as you find something uh, interesting, whether it's what you were hoping to find or thought you were gonna find, or whether it was a surprise incidental finding, put it on a shelf in your brain and finish your routine. And then when you're all done, go back and then address the interesting findings. And then of course you have to document and review 
or document that you did that review um, and the relevant findings in your chart, because if you didn't write it down, of course, you didn't do it. And then, of course, we also need some decision process uh, with what to do if you do find an interesting finding. Okay, let's talk more about interpretation. The fundamental principle is you must be able to recognize normal from abnormal. Well, how do you do that? You first need to recognize normal anatomy and all its variations, which is a really tricky thing to learn. All right? Anatomy varies a lot patient to patient. Um, and when you're looking at it under imaging, all those variations become very apparent. Uh, the best you, things you can do are number one, use symmetry to your advantage. Most anatomic variations are symmetric, symmetrical, right versus right to left. And you can appreciate those in well set up axial and coronal slices. Uh, what I'll come to in a few slides is you can reorient your volume if your patient was scanned crooked, for example, to establish that symmetry and help you uh, interpret the normal anatomy. Uh, the next thing you can do is use all three slices orientations to confirm findings or if you are in arch section, multiple slice orientations to confirm your findings. Uh, what your brain's gonna do is sum up mentally what you're looking at, what may look like pathology in one view with the uh, help of another view may look just fine as normal anatomy. So you have to use all your slice orientations. So, Extending this discussion further, how do you start to learn and define normal? Because again, it all comes back to this. You must be able to recognize what is normal from abnormal. Well, you have to know your anatomy. And how you know your anatomy is, number one, lean on what you learned in dental school, which for uh, myself and many others may be years and years and years ago. Um, but two, the second approach is practice. Look at a lot of cases. So just by looking at every single case you acquire in your office, even if it's for a couple minutes, uh, your, your brain will passively uh, take in that mental map of anatomy and start to build a tolerance for what is normal. And remarkably, I teach this to our dental students and residents. Remarkably, what happens is even if you didn't study the specific signs of a certain specific disease. If you've looked at enough cases, eventually something will pop into your brain and say, huh, that's not quite normal. What is that? I'm gonna look at that further um, because it's gonna be two to three standard deviations different than the 3000 cases you've seen prior. Your brain will passively flag it and bring it to your attention. Uh, you do also though have to study radiographic signs and images of pathology. So. Uh, you can uh, come and join one of our courses or get a radiology, dental radiology textbook and page through and look at the images. Uh, but matching this, knowing normal anatomy versus variations versus abnormal, uh, and then studying the actual what disease looks like, putting that all together is your best approach to uh, successfully interpreting a combing CT scan or any dental radiograph for that matter. So here's an example of what I mean by taking advantage of symmetry. In the axial and coronal views here, I can compare left versus right, make sure everything looks nice, okay? Most anatomic changes will be symmetrical, right? The sinuses and nasal fossa are one example of anatomy where it can vary left versus right, and there always is a slight left versus right variation in uh, patients. If your patient was scanned in a machine crooked, which sometimes happens, use the tools in your software to reorient them. Uh, you can basically turn on some tools, rotate this patient back to, so you're not, you're looking at a patient essentially scanning obliquely or cutting obliquely through them and instead set them up like this. So what image you view will match your mental map of what anatomy um, is there with that symmetry built in. Okay, so we've talked a bit about incidental findings. What to do about them? Do you refer them? Do you ignore them? Do you try and diagnose them? Let's talk a little bit. 
about 90% of cone beam CT scans have incidental findings, which is a big number. So we'll break that down. Of those 90%, about two thirds of them don't require follow-up. Uh, you need to recognize what they are and recognize that they just kind of show up and we don't have to do anything about them. If you don't know what they are, they can be confusing and you start to wonder, is that pathology or what is that? The remaining third of those incidental findings, so about a third of this 90%, do require some form of follow-up or monitoring. That might be as simple as, hey patient, are your sinuses bothering you or is this bothering you? Um, and if the answer is, oh, yep, uh, I'm asymptomatic, you're done. It may be as aggressive as an immediate referral uh, for biopsy or oncology, et cetera, in, in rare cases. And if you wanna read more about these findings, I've got citations here for you. Uh, you could just get on a quick library search and search cone beam CT incidental findings and it would bring up any number of these papers here. So the question I get asked a lot is, what needs follow-up referral? Well, the best answer I can give you is anything you have a question about. If you don't know what it is, there are people around you um, who can help you figure out the answer. So let's talk about your obligations on reviewing and reporting uh, for cone beam CT. And this will be specifically uh, geared around Minnesota and the United States. I know I've got attendees here from uh, all around the world, which is exciting. Um, and my, my uh, disclaimer and advice here is work with your own uh, um, kind of dental uh, regulatory groups to uh, uh, figure out what is appropriate in your dental practice. But so for us regionally here, if there is a cone beam CT, some dentist must review every volume in its entirety for both primary and incidental findings. That could be a general dentist, that could be a specialist, it could be a specialty radiologist like myself. Um, and of course that review and the relevant findings have to be documented in the patient's chart. Um, in some jurisdictions, uh, what can happen uh, and what I've heard happening and experienced happening is a patient will come in, for example, uh, for a scan for implant site number three, and the patient signs a waiver saying, this office is only taking the scan for uh, implant number three, we're not gonna pay attention and we're not liable for anything else on the scan. Um, that itself uh, in, in the United States uh, may be legally fine, maybe not. Um, so my advice there is to uh, consult with your own legal counsel to clarify your exact situation. Um, and, and clarify that if you're part of one of those relationships or clinical operations. In my opinion, uh, I think it's generally thin on medical field legal grounds, but from an ethical perspective, I really don't think it's in the best uh, interest of the patient um, because you've acquired something uh, on, their, uh, on their behalf at cost to them. Um, and it's, I think, in their interest to know everything of benefit uh, from that scan information. And I will also speak that professionally, it's frequently not in your treatment plan interest, meaning many, 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 the majority of surprise uh, incidental findings um, that are serious and require quick follow-up uh, actually do end up somehow influencing a dental treatment plan. So if they sat there unmanaged, uh, you'd learn about it eventually. Building on this, uh, uh, many offices will elect to take a dental alveolar, so jaw skin only, to avoid incidental findings. They can avoid the skull base and spine, that's great, but there are many incidental findings uh, that can show up in the jaws as well, so you're not fully safe. Um, the, the incidental findings, they can be significant, like the rare malignancy, um, but even if not, even if it's something that is really kind of a, a small and uh, ignorable uh, kind of note and move on finding like a dense bone island, they might actually influence a treatment plan. So you do need to pay attention. Um, and the environment we live in is that any general dentist uh, gets held to the specific standard of care associated with the type of procedure being completed. So what that means is if you are reviewing a cone beam CT, you have to do it as good as a reasonable radiologist. 
uh, uh, oral and maxillofacial radiologist. Uh, and that's along the same lines that if you are a general dentist extracting a tooth, you're going to have to do it to the same standard as an oral surgeon. So uh, oral and maxillofacial radiologists review these for help. Um, the question is when to refer. Well, if you are comfortable identifying normal from abnormal, and you've had some sort of advanced training that might be a residency where you've had routine kind of daily hands-on work with home beam CT, or you've uh, uh, attended a, a hands-on kind of day or two day course, and then you from that actively engaged in are uh, you, you know, uh, reviewing all of your scans in your own practice, um, you uh, can review each scan yourself. This is a personal decision about your own comfort and confidence with the information. Uh, you of course have to document that you did the review and the findings in your chart. Um, and our advice is even if you're reviewing scans for yourself and you've done the training and you're practicing and feeling confident with it, do have a relationship with an oral and maxillofacial radiologist uh, so that when you have a question or a significant finding and you're wondering what it is, you can reach out uh, for clarification. We're here to help. Uh, on that note, if you find something and you're confident it needs a biopsy or a surgical intervention, um, I'm a big advocate for team-based care. You can make the referral straight to uh, surgery or ENT as, as appropriate. Um, there is a big need to recognize the abnormality, but I'll say that you don't have to know the diagnosis. Uh, you may not know the diagnosis until biopsy or additional tests are done. And so what I'm teaching these uh, to resident students and, and attendees is recognize the disease category. You just need to know the next step or have an idea of what the disease might be. And from there, go ahead and uh, take a, a direction in the next step. So if you're not comfortable identifying normal from abnormal, you can, uh, or lack the training experience, that hands-on experience, you can refer your uh, scans to a radiologist for review. Um, this is me here, and my email address is up. My colleague at the University of Minnesota, Mansur Ahmad, his email address is here. So if you're regional, feel free to reach out to us for interpretation or any questions for that matter. Um, we wear multiple hats. And again, our advice is whether you routinely send scans for review or not, do have a relationship with an oral and maxillofacial radiologist, just to clarify. In my own phone, I have shortcuts to uh, ENT, um, uh, oral and maxillofacial surgery. Um, I have a head and neck uh, a radiology. Um, neuroradiology, and based on an imaging finding, I may quick call any number of those uh, other specialists to get their opinion. What may be very easy and straightforward for them may be completely confusing for me and vice versa. And that way, via team approach, uh, you can find the expertise you need and come up with the correct answer. Okay. So I'm gonna switch gears here for the last time and talk about uh, imaging for implant treatment and therapy. So we'll talk about some basic and advanced applications of cone beam CT in that regard, and then really just end the evening with a discussion of kind of recommended imaging approaches for implants. Um, I like these pictures here. This is my angry implant. See the angry eyes here? Okay, and then the happy implant, the smiley face and the fun party hat here, okay? I can't hear anybody laughing, but I hope you are. So I'm gonna talk and start here about really three main approaches um, uh, to implant treatment planning. Um, there's a basic approach, uh, a semi-advanced approach, and then a guided surgery approach. And we'll start with the basic. The basic is you are simply getting a visual assessment of the patient's anatomy with some basic height and width uh, alveolar measurements. The scan might look like this. Okay? You don't need a lot of uh, image detail uh, 
to figure uh, to, to go this route. In other words, a higher level of noise, like in this scan, is acceptable because you can start to see exactly where the bone is in the canal as you're fine. What this scan does functionally for you is it gives you um, uh, 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 basic measurements, um, but it's really information going to your brain to help you mentally decide what implant size to select and where it's going to go, and then you will freehand place that implant surgically. The next uh, uh, approach, kind of one step up, is this semi advanced. Uh, approach, which I will call virtual implant visualization, where with a fancier software, you can drop in a generic cylinder, or I'll jump ahead here to a different software, more of a tailored uh, implant uh, um, representation into a planned implant site itself. Uh, many of you are familiar with these, I would guess. Uh, you can use something called an implant library, where you can pick out the exact implant brand and line and size, drop it in, it's dimensionally correct, and you can move it around, twist it, tilt it, move, um, just to make sure it fits exactly the way you want it to. I call this virtual implant visualization because you're still trying out the implant size you want to pick virtually, but you're going to go ahead and still place that implant freehand. In other words, the information goes from the scan, to your brain and then to your patient through your hands. The advanced or high level use of cone beam CT is guided surgery planning. And I've got some fancier images of more sophisticated surgeries here. Uh, what you are fundamentally doing then is um, uh, planning an implant in a software like this, but you will skip this transition to your brain and send that actual data to a printer or an external lab to fabricate a guide that will sit on the teeth. And so this is the stage where the information in the Combium CT scan leaves just being diagnostic for your eyes and your brain only and actually becomes a virtual master cast or articular, however you want to think about it. So this is one example where we're planning multiple implants in the maxilla um for uh, uh full arch prosthesis uh, you can also do these guided surgeries with a dual scan approach um, where you can put markers on the denture scan the patient wearing the denture and then the denture that's up uh, without to create models of that denture and i'm skipping over a lot of detail right here but i'm giving you examples of what can be done okay but my bottom line is that the information, if you're going a guided surgery route, uh, becomes a virtual master cast and articulator, and you need to pay attention that it's correct all the way through. And when you get to this surgery stage and you have the guide, you need to make sure it seats correctly and is, the, is exactly set up the way you thought you wanted it set up or planned or intended it you wanted to set up. Uh, because if you don't do that, then where you prepare your osteotomies through these little guide holes could be any which direction. Here's another example of some dual arch scan where you can start to interface uh, mandibular and maxillary prostheses uh, models into the scan, plan some surgical retention screws and get a guide. Uh, so these steps uh, become quite technically involved, but once you read the recommendations of Kind of a lab or manufacturer, they're really pretty straightforward and fun. And the, the top level uh, right on top of guided surgery planning is where we actually start to integrate uh, occlusal and planned restoration data into the cone beam CT itself. So this is one example here where we've got a cone beam CT scan. We can see what the nerve is. We've planned our virtual implant. We've fused in an occlusal intraoral scan to get very high resolution occlusal data. And then we're also planning the actual prosthesis itself uh, and using that into the cone room data set. And we can start to design and print in office or uh, in an external lab all from this data set. So if you are, whether you're placing implants or not, um, uh, just getting started or an expert, 
there's a number of other factors and really how you or where you start to, on these choices and how you might use imaging cone, or cone beam CT for implant planning, your expertise as a surgeon, uh, the difficulty of the case, whether you want to do a flat versus collapsed surgery um, and any effects on postoperative pain, um, what information you can gain clinically, uh, whether you are um, dealing with a lot of space or uh, uh, very little space for your implant actual placement, um, the desired level of accuracy and aesthetic outcome, um, and also chair side time for the Columbium CT acquisition, interpretation and planning versus what time you sp uh, set, um, spend chair side uh, in your daily workflow um, and any avoidance of possible complications. I'm skipping over basically hours and hours worth of research and discussion here. And I bring these points up for you to consider in your own practice if you're getting started or actively engaged with implant placement. Uh, what are the factors, factors influencing your specific setup and how might you use imaging or not uh, to move forward? Okay, in the last few minutes here, I'm really going to review. Um, uh, uh, kind of the recommended or best practice uh, uh, for imaging around implants. And I'm going to break these into three distinct uh, clinical scenarios. Initial patient assessment, this is basically the patient walking in the door. And then preoperative site-specific planning, that's where you've identified an edentulous site and you want to plan an implant. And then post-operative evaluation is the implant's already there and you're just checking out whether there's a problem or not. So let's start with the initial patient assessment. This is what I call routine dental care. The patient comes in the door um, and the best imaging recommendation is a panoramic um, and uh, indicated intraoral imaging or bite wing, be that bite wing or periapicals to identify your routine dental pathology and any potential implant sites. Um, at this time, and we discussed this a bit at the end of last week, cone beam CT is not a recommended frontline or initial indication imaging tool. It's too much from a dose uh, and a time perspective. So after this, you've taken care of your dental disease and you've identified edentulous sites where uh, implants might be an option. The general goals for our preoperative site-specific planning stage, which is where we are, is we need to see the rich um, anatomic dimensions in relation to the desired location of the restoration and relate that restorative goal to the alveolar morphology, okay? So it's ideal to know a bunch of measurements, mesiodistal, facial, lingual, superior, inferior, we can get all that with uh, 3D imaging and or clinical information, uh, but depending on what we're looking for. We also want to evaluate the cortical bone thickness and trabecular bone quality. We also want to rule out any pathology that could compromise our implant outcome. That could be retained root temps, impacted teeth, residual infections, or the rare pathology, be it a tumor or cyst or other lesions. And so if we look at our conventional options, um, then our, our 2D intraoral and panoramic choices are subject to a, quite a bit of distortion. So I'm just gonna revisit this quickly here and we'll compare that to cone beam CT, which is really pretty accurate. So if we look at first, intraoral imaging advantages. Of course, it's really easy. It's really high resolution, higher resolution than cone beam CT by a, a wide margin, actually. Um, it can tell you the status of the adjacent teeth and the alveolar crest. Um, can tell you a little bit about vertical height and bone. It's low cost and low radiation. Okay, but we, of course, have no cross-sectional information um, and our associated distortion and magnification is really dependent on where the x-ray tube is or your operator technique. And because of that, if we measure crest to canal from periapicals, only about half of those will be accurate to within a millimeter. And so here's an example 
of two different periapicals with different angulations, we're getting about a 20% change in these two measurements here. So we really can't measure much from periapicals. They're too distorted. If we look at panoramic imaging, of course, that's very easy. Um, and it can identify uh, your critical structures, your canals and sinuses from a first glance perspective. You, of course, get a large anatomic field of coverage and they're low cost and really uh, pretty low radiation. But the downsides is they're quite subject to patient positioning errors. Um, and based on that, or on, excuse me, on top of that, uh, there are inherent distortions based on basic assumptions that each machine makes about its focal trough um, and where the patient is. And that'll vary 20 to 30%, so a sizable number machine to machine, or, or model to model. Um, uh, magnification in panoramic radi radiography is more variable than in the vertical plane, sorry, more variable in the horizontal plane than in the vertical plane. And so what I'm getting at here is all these top factors mean that if we look at measurements from crest to canal on pans, only about 17% of them are accurate to within a millimeter. And of course, we're not getting any 3D information. There's superimposed structures. Right, you can't tell what's going on in that third dimension. Building on this, right, a pans typically have this upward beam angle. Okay, and just simply where I'll orient you here, this would be a cross section of a posterior dentulous mandible where this is buccal and this is lingual. Just simply where the canal may be located buccally or lingually could change its projected height from the canal. And again, that's contributing to why we're getting only a 17% accuracy to within a millimeter from crest to canal measurements. If we look at cross-sectional imaging, uh, that could be something called conventional tomography or panoramic based scanography and tomography or cone beam CT and CT. Uh, I'll show you examples of these because we really haven't discussed these yet. Okay. The broad advantage to all of these is there's Minimal to no anatomic superimposition, great. Uh, so let's look at this cross-sectional imaging in 3D. This would be examples of tomography and panoramic-based scanography. If anybody has a fancier panoramic machine in their office, you can get some of these crude kind of 3D tomography or scanography assessments where you can get an idea of where the canal is. Uh, the challenges with these is the field of view is typically limited and they're blurred quite a bit. So most of the time I see offices electing straight for cone beam CT and skipping over these options. Uh, CT, so medical or multi-detector CT is also an option which is very accurate. Uh, however, it's more expensive and higher dose and typically only available in hospitals and imaging centers. And also uh, the data or uh, image formatting uh, may or may not work well with uh, specific implant planning softwares. So I'm, I'm kind of rambling on and on here about uh, different imaging options, but really what it comes down to is in dentistry nowadays, Combium CT is really darn useful for implant planning. Uh, it's accurate um, because of that 3D uh, data, um, you're going to see uh, accuracy rates from crest to canal around 94, 95%. That missing 5%, interestingly, is from a few times when a metal artifact just obscures the crest, not actually the nerve itself. So this is really markedly more accurate than our periapical or panoramic images. Uh, the fact that we get dental specific units with uh, uh, dental specific fields of view um, and dental specific or implant specific software makes it really, really useful for us. And, and the best news like we built on our discussion last week is they're fairly dose efficient as well. We get great information for not a lot of dose. Okay. Uh, where I'll end this here is, um, Home Beam CT is really a very useful tool for many, 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 many uh, implant cases. If you are an advanced surgeon, there are many cases you can place 
without cross-sectional imaging safely. Uh, but if you're what I what I'm reading from the dental field is that if you are um, uh, new to implant placement, the comb beam CT can really steepen your learning curve quite a bit for every single implant. All right, we'll leave that preoperative assessment scenario behind and discuss postoperative implant evaluation. And so this is where the implant is in and the patient's back, right? They may be asymptomatic and you're evaluating to make sure everything's going well. They may have symptoms or problems they're complaining about. So the main goal is to confirm your bone implant interface, make sure that that implant is integrated, okay? Um, and so the general recommendation is uh, if the patient is asymptomatic with an existing implant and there are no clinical abnormalities, a simple periapical radiograph to look at that mesial and distal um, uh, peri-implant bone works great. A problem with imaging implants, existing implants with Combium CT is the metal artifact. And that metal artifact, like we discussed last week, can dis, uh, really obscure uh, the adjacent tissues. And really what we're concerned about is obscuring the peri-implant bone interface in this case. So our recommendation is if you have a patient with uh, an existing implant with symptoms or any sort of clinical uh, complications, be it mobility, purulence, altered sensation, et, et cetera, do order and acquire the comb beam CT to get a 3D assessment of what might be going on. I also still advocate for the single periapical to get that one image without a lot of artifact to see that mesial and distal bone. The combination of the two in many cases can clarify what might be going on uh, with that particular implant. Very good. I'm gonna stop here and first say thanks for your attendance in this uh, evening program. And what I'm gonna do next here is try and get through our questions. So I'll go all the way up to the top, I'll order them. Uh, answer them in order, and I see 11 here, so I think we'll be able to get through them all. But as we go, if you have additional questions, uh, we'll go as long as we can to complete them within reason. So the first question is, tips for taking image on heavily built patients with shoulder issues. Okay, I know these patients. Um, the uh, best thing you can do, I mean, of course, you're going to try and get them to relax your uh, their shoulders as much as they can. Um, many, many machines, uh, you can raise the field of view up just a little bit and you'll still get what you need. Um, many other times, if you can tilt their um, uh, patient's chin up, that will uh, raise that field of view interest away from their shoulders. You can scan them then, uh, and later on, you'll get the scan and they're gonna look, chin up, but in the software, you can tilt them back down, and reorient them normally to kind of wrap your brain around what's going on. So that works for most patients with big, big shoulders um, and uh, or otherwise mobility issues who can't get the image. Uh, if you still can't get it, you may simply have to go find a different office with a different unit, a bigger field of view unit to get that image. And I've experienced that where you've got a large patient um, uh, or a broad shouldered patient and they simply just can't fit into that medium or small, uh, small field of view machine. And we have to then go to a larger field of view machine. Okay, next question. How to address the issue of not being able to center the patient while taking the image. I think I've got at that a little bit too. Uh, if you can have control over your field of view, um, choose a larger field of view. And even if that data is over towards the sides of the field of view, you can get it. Chin up helps. Um, and uh, again, there are a certain subset, thankfully it's uncommon, but there's a certain subset of patients where uh, we actually have to go deliberately to uh, a larger field of view machine. Next question is, does microleakage of restorations 
is it recognizable by cone beam CT? Um, no, it's not at this time. Uh, really, the detail is there. And e whether it's uh, metallic or, um, uh, excuse me, uh, composite restoration, there's typically too much artifact nearby to pick up on any sort of micro leakage. Now, I'll say as an aside, there's been some research efforts to look at uh, dyeing, kind of having an iodine or a contrast agent that is carries or leakage uh, a specific, so it attaches to a carry actively decayed lesion. Um, and that's a really neat idea. However, once we introduce saliva to the situation, that kind of contrast agent rinses everywhere uh, and it isn't very helpful at this time for patient imaging. Next question, do I have a favorite app to help learn normal anatomy? Uh, there, last time I checked, there are a couple um, apps on uh, anatomy. My most uh, straightforward advice is to find a relatively recent copy of uh, White and Farrell's Oral and Maxillofacial Radiology textbook. And um, you can you find some uh, older, oh boy, I think we're on the eighth edition now. And if you find the seventh or even the sixth, those are all acceptable uh, editions. I wouldn't go back earlier than that. You can find them online for 50 to $100. Uh, there's a great anatomy section in the later versions of those. And wonderful, even if you just open those up and look at the pictures and read the captions, so you don't even read the text, you can learn so much uh, radiology really, really casually and fun. That's what I would recommend. Next question, Silas, can you share examples of it? Oh, I would love to, but I don't have any prepared right now. Uh, in general, I can describe them as you're gonna see soft tissue uh, kind of masses of variable sizes uh, in the locations of the salivary glands or their ducts. And the other, if they're in the gland, they tend to be rounder, like they're in the gland, if they're in a duct, they can be a little more oblong shaped. Uh, the most common gland is the submandibular, followed by the sublingual, followed by the parotid. Um, so it's rare or less common to see the parotid uh, stones. Okay, can you recommend, next question is, can you recommend a really good book or online resource for radiographic interpretation, especially interpreting cone beam CT? Um, absolutely, that I would go back to White and Farrell. Um, and any of the later editions there. And if you really want uh, a bigger, heavier duty book, um, there's Lisa Koenig's uh, Diagnostic Imaging. Um, it is Oral and Maxillofacial Radiology. Um, it's several hundred pages. It's a more expensive test textbook, but has pages and pages of great pictures. Can you address, our next question is, can you address appropriate methods for sending images to be HIPAA compliant? Um, absolutely. Uh, uh, there are ways to um, de-identify scanned data and send it, but I do not recommend that for clinical information, clinical reasons, because ultimately the point of a DICOM data, uh, which Combium CTs are stored as, is that the patient information is tied to that scan. So we know who it is, we know when the scan was taken, uh, um, with what scan parameters, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so whatever transfer system you're gonna use is, would be the same way you would transfer PHI via email. Um, if you have a secured email platform that can handle large attachments, you can attach it that way. Uh, what we use is a platform called uh, ShareFile, which is like Dropbox, but it is HIPAA compliant. And with that uh, interface file transfer uh, uh, service, we can move scans and reports securely very quickly. Um, another secured service we use at the university is Box. Um, and so if it's a HIPAA compliant data transfer service, it works to scan or send scans. Uh, my side note on that is um, the uh, export in a DICOM format. 
Uh, there are some software programs that will uh, export a wrapped viewer that's convenient, um, but sometimes locks you into that viewer um, and won't let you do some of the more fancy analyses you could do if you just had the DICOM and can open it in a different software program. Next question, do you send an impression in addition to the scan? Uh, and I'm going to make the assumption that that question relates to guided surgery planning. Um, the answer is yes. Much of the time now, uh, with guided surgery, you are sending some form of occlusal data with a cone beam CT. Uh, that occlusal data could be an impression. It could be an optically scanned impression. It could be an optically scanned cast. It could be an intraoral optical scan as well. So any of those high resolution kind of records of occlusal data work for guided surgery. The reason that's happening is the cone beam CT occlusal data typically isn't um, uh, typically isn't good enough to build an uh, accurate guide. You need to supplement that data somehow with high resolution occlusal data. Now, my bottom line advice is if you are going to do guided surgery, you know, figure out a vendor or a service that you work in, just ask them, get from them, find that recommended protocol, that recipe, and follow it to a T. They will walk you through step by step uh, what to do and when. And they will typically include uh, specific scan settings that they want and recommend resolution, uh, et cetera, um, to do that guide. So my advice earlier uh, was really more generic. If you're doing specific guided, uh, look for those details. Next question is how to limit scatter from metal dental work only with, with cotton rolls. Um, as we discussed last week, you really can't uh, avoid the metal scatter. It's there. We remove what metal we can if it's removable. Um, uh, but as we discussed last week, we as dentists like to put a lot of things, metal things in people's mouths that are not easily removable. Uh, there you can open up the patient's mouth and get rid of a lot of metal on the opposing arch that tends to minimize some streak artifact. Um, from that metal. Uh, there are other softwares which have a metal artifact reduction system which can minimize some of those far field artifacts. What they don't do is recreate the data. They're kind of disguising the artifact. Um, so we really just have to live with it. Um, a great trick I've learned from some of our techs is that if you know specifically that you want to be in a certain imaging a certain area uh, and not get artifact there, uh, you can deliberately tip the patient's chin up or chin down based on where you're trying to move that streak artifact um, and image the patient. And what's happening is that streak artifact really stays horizontal in the machine. It follows the path of the x-ray beam. And if you're clever, you can project it away from where you need to look at an implant site um, by tilting the patient's chin up or chin down. You then just reorient it in your software later. So that's that we we rarely have to do that clinically. Many times we just have the implant and or sorry the streak artifact there, and we deal with it. Um, but in a, in rare cases that can be a useful sneaky technique. Uh, is the cone beam CT easy to transfer to a CD? Yes, absolutely. Most softwares uh, I'm aware of allow you to burn it um, to a CD. Uh, and that's an acceptable and secure transfer. Um, I'll, I'll insert kind of my comments that CDs themselves, they get lost in the mail. The mail is slow itself. Um, they get scratched and damaged um, and they can be misplaced in your office easily. So from that perspective, I really think that like secure kind of online peer-to-peer uh, uh, web transfer and cloud transfer is a better option. It's faster, it's more secure, it's backed up um, and doesn't get damaged easily. Minimal age for implants. Oh boy, uh, that's our next question. Um, a fantastic question. And I will say at first that I am a formally trained oral and maxillofacial radiologist. So uh, I'm, I'm really strong in diagnostics and I try to keep my feet out of you know, true implant treatment planning uh, decisions. 
that being said, my my read of implantology and, and from what I get from my surgery, surgical and implant colleagues is that cessation of skeletal growth, so kind of this early 20s age is really the minimum age for implants. Um, there's some discussion around that based on where the implant is, aesthetic goals, et cetera. Uh, next question, do you see this becoming more routine procedure in the future? Um, I'll, uh, I kind of assume that's a broad blanket comb beam CT. Is it more routine in the future? Uh, I see comb beam CT as here to stay in dentistry. Um, and because it, it's really found indications in use in almost every area of dentistry, pathology, surgery, implants, endodontics, orthodontics, uh, TMD, uh, oral facial pain. It's there. Um, I, some of my other research interests are MRI um, and uh, interestingly hard tissue and tooth MRI. Uh, so someday we may be looking at MRIs. Uh, we can get away without ionizing radiation and can see quite a bit more in the soft tissue and hard tissue with uh, uh, that approach compared to using x-rays. Uh, but for the foreseeable uh, future chromium CT is here. Whether it's routine or not is a slightly different question. I, I still think that because we have uh, um, ionizing radiation, you ordering and acquiring a comb beam CT um, will be based on the clinical scenario. Next question, at what minimal age is it reasonable to take a comb beam CT scan? Um, my answer to this is there is no minimum age limit. If there is an appropriate clinical indication um, uh, for a chrome beam CT scan, uh, go ahead and take it regardless of the patient's age. Now that being said, uh, most of the time in pediatric age patients, uh, they are getting imaging um, if there's a really distinct and strong dental anomaly, say you're sus uh, suspecting an odontoma or something like that, or there's a major disturbance in eruption patterns, and you're figuring out what's going on. A lot of times a pan does an okay job too, is getting us right in the direction. Uh, once you get to a certain lower limit of age, uh, speaking from the experience of my two-year-old and four-year-old this afternoon, um, the kids just can't sit still that long. Uh, and what we've done in the past is if we have a young kiddo who really needs a uh, 3D imaging, we'll actually order a medical CT, which goes quite quickly. It's just a second or less for that jaw and head and neck anatomy. Uh, and uh, in that setting, you actually have the option of sedation too. So if a patient really just can't stay still because they're really young and you must, must, must have that 3D information, the medical CT might be the way to go. Next question, should hygienists learn how to interpret CBCT for pathology? and as routine practice? Oh, great question. Um, uh, from a legal perspective, uh, the answer is no, you don't have to, uh, because ultimately that gets shouldered on the DDS of the doctor in that practice. Um, but we've got this really interesting uh, practice in dentistry now, or kind of convention, where uh, hygiene uh, as a, a, a profession does a fair amount of uh, radiographic interpretation and, and really backs up the dentist uh, as they come in for a lot of these exams. Uh, I, I am the course director and oversee the entire radiology training for our hygiene program at the school. So I meet with the hygiene director and uh, feedback on board's examinations and really clinical expectations. Um, and radiology, interestingly, is a, high, um, uh, a highly focused area. And so in that sense, I think it's worth, uh, there's no harm in any member of the dental team having uh, comfort uh, acquiring and understanding what anatomy um, is in a comb beam CT. If you're already looking at periapicals and panoramics, it's just one other piece of the dental imaging toolkit. Um, that being said, you don't have to have uh, the same level of expertise as a DDS or a uh, specialty radiologist. Next question regarding panoramic images. We sometimes have overlap of vertebrae on the mandible. What would you tell your staff to minimize this problem? 
Um, my first guess uh, would be to check the focal trough settings on your panoramic image. Um, occasionally they'll be set to some universal standard or it might be set to large or small and that can create some uh, possible overlap problems. A lot, I most commonly see this when a pediatric patient gets into put into a machine with an adult focal trough setting and we scan way back to the uh, um, uh, spine and get that superimposition. Uh, other uh, problems um, that can show up is if the patient's too far forward or uh, sometimes they'll capture that spine. Uh, the clue that that's happening is those front teeth will be very horizontally minified or really shrunk in the horizontal direction. They'll look skinny. Uh, next question, lead aprons are recommended or required at this point? Okay, so in Minnesota, uh, a lead apron is only required if the central beam of the x-ray machine is within, I believe, two inches. I'll have to go reference it, two inches of the gonads. Uh, which really does not happen in the dental office or shouldn't happen in the dental office. So from a legal perspective, uh, lead aprons are not required. Um, and I could dive into about a 45 minute discussion of all the research and, and, and policy and recommendations around that. My advice to you would be to go search the ADA um, radiographic criteria uh, I mentioned last week, it's available online and read that. They mentioned the use of lead and thyroidate um, collars, lead aprons and thyroid collars. Uh, the real quick answer is for comb beam CT, uh, thyroid collars, also panoramic uh, imaging thyroid collars, don't use them because they can get in the way of the x-ray beam and really corrupt and disrupt the image formation. Next question, does the size of your sensor matter and what can be reimpressed for a panoramic rendered from a comb beam CT? There are eight, 10, 11, and full sensors. I have to apologize, I don't know the answer to that question, so I'll dig a little bit. Um, but if you happen to find out an answer, feel free to shoot me an email and share what you learned. So I'm stumped on that one. Next question, how do you describe a lesion to a dental radiologist? Uh, great question, and I didn't dive into it, but there are really a number of categories we define features. One of them is size of the lesion. Uh, one of them is borders, whether they are poorly defined or well-defined, corticated or non-corticated, etc. One of the categories is shape, so if it's round or ovoid or irregular. Um, one of them is internal contents, whether there's calcifications uh, or not, uh, radiolucent, radiopaque. And one of them is effects on adjacent structures. So is it resorbing or displacing teeth? If you stick to those kind of categories and, and work from there, um, that's a good way to kind of refer uh, uh, your thoughts about a lesion. Uh, that being said, if that is confusing to you, um, what you can do is say, hey, I, I see this thing, it's radiolucent, it's radiopaque, and here's about where I'm seeing it. What do you think is going on? And, and sending the image is, is good enough and we can communicate from there. Well, next question, what is a good online resource for radiographic interpretation practice? I'm gonna refer you back to White and Farrow textbook then. I, I really, think that's the best. There are some online versions of that text as well. Um, in that sense, you're not going to get a lot of hands-on practice there, but it'll cover really what your, um, uh, uh, the, the breadth of what dental imaging uh, requires for comb beam CT. Next question, can all kinds of tooth cracks be identified using comb beam CT? Question mark, question mark, question mark. No, the answer is really no. Um, we're di I'm, like I mentioned, I'm diving into this as a research interest. Uh, we know that there are lots of types of cracks and fractures that are way too small and or obscured by artifact to be visualized on comb beam CT. That being said, what we're learning, we don't have a lot of data on this, so we're, we're kind of taking it one step at a time, is that if you are suspicious of a crack or fracture, in a tooth in any way, 
and you're kind of down at the bottom of your list, you don't, you're searching, you know, it, it will this, if it has a crack, it'll mean one thing for treatment, if it doesn't, et cetera. Um, it's still worth acquiring that cone beam CT. Uh, many times we can get just a little clue that something might be going on, even if we don't see uh, the fracture or crack itself. Um, fractures are a little, they're still not great, but they're a little easier to see. Uh, two cracks being in the, starting in the crown is really tough because typically there's restorations there or right next door that cast a lot of artifact in the way. Um, I'll say as an aside too, we're uh, in the early state, well, we've, we've been at the really kind of basic stages of trying to use MRI, interestingly, to detect root fractures and cracks. Uh, and the thought behind that is MRI is very, very good at picking up fluid and water, um, so much so that we can image uh, theoretically um, crack sizes that are way smaller than the uh, best resolution of our MRI scan simply because any little bit of fluid or water in that crack or fracture can overwhelm that pixel or voxel signal and show us where it is. So we've got a couple uh, ex vivo basically extracted two studies um, looking at that, seeing some evidence, uh, but we're paralleling it with uh, developing MRI technology. Um, so it's a work in progress. Next question, can you suggest the basics to use the implant library? Sure, yeah, uh, based on what software you have, uh, just play. Uh, so using that implant library is really, what it is is a, a catalog um, that you have to kind of routinely update if it's not done all automatically for you. It's a catalog of implant brands with all their implant lines and the various sizes. And so when you are doing this virtual planning or uh, guided surgery planning, you may have a preferred implant line in your office. Um, and uh, based on that proposed site, you pick out the size you think you need uh, the, of the brand and model and uh, uh, drop it right into the patient's scan and start moving around. Uh, and I'll go back to my initial response is just play with your software. Don't be afraid to uh, push all the buttons. If something gets screwed up on your scan, you close the program and open it up again, nobody gets hurt. Next question, any recommendations on training for taking better Combium CTs with ICAT? Our office has had some image quality issues. Um, I've tried their customer service options already. Hands-on training would be great. Um, sure, go ahead. Uh, feel free to send me an email. Uh, so my exact response to that um, uh, kind of depends on the struggle you're having. If it's a, a patient motion thing um, or really like a button, you know, kind of what buttons to push and when, uh, I can guide you with that. Uh, occasionally with uh, um, the uh, um, different machines, there may be a technical or a um, kind of a calibration issue, which we have to go back to the manufacturer and say, hey, we really think this is a calibration issue. Can you specifically help you out with that? And that's typically easy to fix too. Okay. Oh, good. I think this is an answer to our discussion earlier. Height has to be about 13 centimeters in the scan to capture the condyle, eight by eight with captures teeth up. Uh, with capture teeth only pan image. Thank you. And that's Shelly who I've met, so she can help uh, with iCat as well. With that, thank you so much. I think we got all the questions. Have a very wonderful evening and uh, don't feel afraid to reach out and we'll talk soon. Oh, wait, I have one more question. What do you find the most challenging or see others most often miss on a comb beam CT. Uh, the interestingly, so this would be an incidental finding thing. Uh, I'll answer this in a couple ways. The place I see people really derail most often is if they just don't open up and review the whole scan. They may look at a semi-automated panoramic view only and they neglect to look at the whole scan and really miss a large finding. And that's an easy one to avoid. You just open it up and look. Um, the next way I'd answer this question is they, they look at the teeth only and avoid kind of the sinuses and the skull base and the spine. Um, and it can, even though it's rare, things do show up there. 
Um, and so uh, occasionally, the good news there is typically um, uh, 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 with some training and some help, you'll do okay. Um, the third way I'll answer this question is, uh, uh, and I'll go back a little bit, and with enough training to know when to reach out to help from a radiologist or, or uh, uh, et cetera. The third way I'll answer this question is, uh, where do I uh, see the most challenging areas? Uh, is interestingly abnormal kind of findings around teeth because we as dentists, we are so used to looking at the teeth. Um, we're maybe not familiar with looking at some other conditions like the periapical osseous dysplasias um, or other lesions of bone and you uh, may confuse them for a simple uh, periapical cyst um, and really miss a subtle finding. So in that sense, when we do our hands-on course, we focus a lot on kind of subtle and mild dental and dental alveolar findings, things that you're gonna look at because you're looking at the teeth and you may gloss right over uh, simply because nobody's pointed out to you what might be going on. It takes practice, quite frankly. You have to do it every day, like anything else, to stay comfortable. Very good. We'll wrap it up here. Thank you again for your attendance. Have a wonderful evening. Hang in there. Uh, and we will be seeing you soon, I hope.